Are you looking for new books to read? Do you like finding a new special author? Are you tired of the same old books from the same old authors? Well then, welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where you can hear from fantastic new authors. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have worked hard to write great new books. Hear about their book and why you should check it out. So sit back and listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. Hello, Discovered Wordsmith land. Welcome to another episode. Uh, Before we get to the author and book today, I wanted to tell you that over the weekend I was in Salem, Massachusetts with a group of wonderful authors, and we're working on an anthology, which will come out soon. But uh, some of those authors are going to be coming up. They're exciting uh, stories to tell and people to meet and some great books that I'm sure you'll love. So I'm excited about talking to them and getting them on here for everybody. But today's author is Samantha Hart, who has led an interesting life that she's compiled into a memoir. She ran away from home at 14. She worked in the music industry at Geffen Records, and she's also worked in the music industry, or I'm sorry, the movie industry, with some uh, movies that you may know. So it's a interesting story. She has good stories to tell and her book is uh, something she hopes gets out there to help other young girls that may be in the same situation as she has. So uh, let's get going. And here's Samantha Hart. Today on the podcast, I've got Samantha Hart, the author of Blind Pony, a true story as near as I can tell. Is that correct? As true a story as I can tell. As true a story as I can tell. Well, well, Samantha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So before we get talking about your book, finding out about uh, what what it's about, tell us a little bit about you, uh, what you like to do, you do, you do outside or before you wrote and published. I started my career quite young. Um, I was working as a photo stylist. I did a little modeling. Um, I traveled a lot and learned a lot from, you know, those travels around the world. And when I really started my career in earnest, it was in the music business. And I had the privilege of working at Geffen Records in the heyday um, when there was a lot of, you know, exciting bands. It was indie rock and roll. It was Aerosmith, Nirvana, Guns N' Roses. It was that whole era. And um, and then I segued my career as a creative director into uh, indie movie marketing. And I had the privilege of working for Gramercy Pictures, which is now Focus Features. And it, I worked on films like Dazed and Confused. Um, there was recently a book out, uh, The Oral History of Richard Linklater's Dazed and Confused. And I was interviewed for that because I did the marketing campaign for the film. And I worked on Four Weddings and a Funeral, and we were really cutting new ground because back then, you know, British films weren't very popular in the U.S. yet. If you can believe it, they wanted, when we sent prints around, bicycle prints around the United States, they were saying, can you send us a subtitled version? We can't understand it. Um, so, it, you know, it was like a different time. It was definitely indie uh, filmmaking, and I worked on... Um, Boys Don't Cry and Full Monty and uh, that was before I started at Searchlight and Waking Ned Divine and went on to you know work at Universal for larger films like Meet the Parents Um, and then I started my own company and I had several offices I ran a company of like 50 people and we were doing kind of I called it indie advertising where we were one of the first companies and we were, our hub was in Chicago. We were traditionally a post house initially, and then we expanded into production and we put everything under one roof so that we could do, you know, everything soup to nuts. At some point I got kind of it became tedious because I, I really started that company because I wanted to create a company where I wanted to work. 
and it like everything it kind of blew up and became this big company it wasn't satisfying me and i wanted to do the creative work not just the production and post i wanted to actually start you know writing the ads and doing more creative work that way so we started we kind of ended that era and when we moved back to los angeles my partner and i and we started wild bill our company now and we work on a much smaller you know more nimble model and take on more of the projects that we are interested in we help a lot of startups we do a lot of nonprofit work um we do big campaigns still but you know it's sort of with a bent of you know trying to be more creative with it so it was during the time that i started wild bill i i kind of also selfishly wanted to do that because i I wanted to start writing. You know, that was always my passion was writing. And I've kept journals since I was 12 years old. You know, everybody's always said to me over the years at cocktail parties or whatever, you should write a book, you should write a book. Because I have a lot of very funny stories about my life. As you can imagine, I was a teenage runaway. I ran away when I was 14. When you start that young, you have a lot of stories. And Definitely, you have a lot of experiences as a fish out of water type person. I think that initially people were saying you should write a book because they thought it was so extraordinary, all these stories. When I finally had the time to write, I really realized what I had to write about was actually very painful and sad. And it became a real catharsis for me. You know, and then I would put it away because it was just too emotional for me. I'd just shove it in a drawer. And I also have, I have three children. I have a grown daughter and I have two teenage sons. You know, I've been a mother most of my life, actually. And so I, between running my company and my children and doing all my creative work or whatever, I, I, I was just like, yeah, the book, whatever. But then when the pandemic hit, you know, and I, our company kind of shut down, I really had the time to really go back and look at it again with fresh eyes and in a different place in my life. And it really hit me. I have to tell this story. I have to, it became kind of my heart's mission it, just to finish it. And so I did. And nice. that's blind pony is true stories I can tell. Up to this. So point. <laughs> pardon. Uh, up to this point. You're up yeah. To the memoir. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> jump, jumping back real quick for a second. Uh, what you mentioned Aerosmith, Guns N' Roses, and some good movies like Waking the Divine and that. What did you do with the music industry and uh, the movie industry? Okay, well, in the in the music industry, I I started out working for Neil Diamond's publishing company, and I kind of was just knew nothing about the mu music business. Just kind of. It's a long story I won't go into, but just kind of ended up sort of living in the basement cellar of this music publishing office, kind of like a little rat down in the cellar, and started, you know, uh, working as a secretary and answering the phone. And I was terrible at it, by the way. I got better at it. For the, <laughs> you know, it, it required, you know, very fast typing. And you know, I didn't have the skill set, but anyway, I kind of faked my way through that. And but I learned a lot about music publishing. And then I went to Chapel Inner Song. When, at Chapel Inner Song, I really think I developed a lot of musical taste. You know, I heard about a job. I worked at Chapel. I assisted a song plugger. You know, an A and R kind of you know artist and repertoire song plugger. And I got like fascinated with the old catalog of Bernie Toppin that he wrote with Martin Page that not a lot of people knew about. And then those songs became blew up with heart, had a hit with it. And so did Jefferson Starship. We built the city was one of them. Uh, you know, so, you know, just developing my taste or whatever. So then I heard about this job at Wyndham Hill and it was, um, it was to work in the A&R slash production division, but being the assistant to this woman um, who ran it. And I thought, well, I kind of know that A&R, like I have great taste in music. And so it sounded perfect. And I'll assist, and I'll apprentice under her and I'll learn things, right? The day I started, literally she quit. There's some big blow up. 
So they took the A&R part, the artist and repertoire part of it away. And it was strictly a production job. When you say production, I thought, you know, produ- producing records, like it was going to be fun, right? No, sure. this was nuts and bolts production, making masters, you know, um, and the old fashioned way at the time, you know, and, and printing the covers, going on press and all that kind of stuff. And so I knew nothing about that. You know, I always had an interest in graphic design from my early years assisting a photographer and doing styling and set decorating. I And then I did have a job at a design firm, you know, as a freelancer or whatever, and I was interested in that, but I didn't know how to put all the pieces together. I mean, again, talking about someone with very little life experience, running away at 14, how do you put the building blocks together to build a career for yourself? You know, I didn't even... I mean, I just kind of was flying by the seat of my pants most of the time. So I'll never forget, I went, Wyndham Hill was distributed by A&M Records. They asked me to, I had to go to the production meeting to represent Wyndham Hill my first week. And again, I knew nothing about what they were talking about. So they're going around this big conference table and I'm sitting there, you know, they're talking about shipping the parts and this plant and that pressing plant and, you know, whatever. And, and then they said, Wyndham Hill, have you shipped the parts yet? And I just blankly stared at them and said, the wing or the thigh, (laughs) like chicken parts. I mean, you know, I was like admitting you may as well be talking chicken parts. I have no idea what you're talking about. And, you know, it was so, it, it just stunned the room. And then there was giggling, but it really wasn't at my expense. People loved it, you know, cause they, they kind of heard that the story that I came over and A&M records was always looking at Wyndham Hill as like the silly, you know, the, the effete label, but kind of the little stepsister over here that doesn't know what she's doing. They're actually very smart people, Wyndham Hill. And I learned a lot working there, but I learned so much from A&M. So Aubrey Moore, the head of production just looked at me and he just loved that I, wasn't trying to pose. I wasn't trying to be insincere or sarcastic. I was just kind of putting my cards on the table, so to speak. And he just turned to his right-hand woman and he said, get this kid up to speed, Janice. And she did. And within a month, I I could have told you anything about pressing records. And I was going on press checks for Wyndham Hill and Chicago and really just busting a move. And I became very good at it. And I was recruited by Geffen Records to come because they had the same kind of dynamic with Warner Brothers. You know, they were distributed by Warner Brothers. So they wanted sort of uh, uh, me to come in and be the liaison with Warner Brothers because at the time the White Snake album was exploding. They wanted me to be there to sort of push the production executive to get our records on press before Warner Brothers. A lot of it was just this nuts and bolts production. And then I grew into more of the graphic arts and I started the art department, the creative department. And then I went on to invent a package that kind of revolutionized how CDs were shipped. I don't know if you recall the old long boxes, the six by 12s. Well, it was Jetson technology in a Flintstone package, right? It was this two six by 12s fit in a rack as a 12 by 12 album then they just didn't want a retrofit. So it was, you know, it's like, so I, I kind of had that kind of a mind or I have that kind of a mind where I sort of look at things and if it just seems silly, it, I want to change it. You know, I was talking about digital film delivery and the film business long before and streaming and day and date releases way back in late ni- 90s, long before it was a thing. Geffen, I was just known as a, like a disruptor. And when the Nirvana baby came out, it was Kurt's idea to put the baby on the cover, but he had found a photo he liked of a baby girl. And it was way too expensive for an indie band. And it was like a $10,000 photo or something. So um, the art director and creative director and me you know, threw the bunch of babies in a pool at a swimming class. 
And the art director found this, you know, Robert Fisher is the art director. He found this baby boy. And I'm like, we were all like, that's perfect. We loved it. And so I took it up to the marketing, to the president, to the marketing meeting. And they were like, well, the penis has to go. And they, at the time it was like, verbiage was, I text the penis off. And I'm like, well, why would you want to go and do that? You know, this is a boy band. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Well, Walmart Mark won't carry it. And I'm like, well, maybe that's a good thing. Walmart won't carry it. So it became a whole thing. And, you know, like, so I've always been known as kind of a disruptor. And I went to get David Geffen and fought for that. And uh, it's hard to describe what I do, what I did there in terms of like, I kind of went off into different. The, the great thing about working at Geffen was David had, a you know, sort of a thing where we had business cards, but they didn't say what you did on it. He said, if people don't know what you do, then you're not doing it. And so it allowed me the freedom to kind of think out of the box and go beyond my comfort zone. You know, I created a package that sort of revolutionized everything because it folded onto itself. You did not throw it away. So it was, um, but the real, the real impetus behind it was getting rid of the box because to ship something this big is a lot less than shipping something this big. If you think about it. All the CDs were being shipped out of Terre Haute, Indiana at the time. That's all across the country, all around the world. You know, that's a lot of money, right? For shipping something that large that you really don't need, you're going to throw it away. It kind of worked out, you know, and then I tell a story in the book. I don't really talk about my career all that much in the book. It's more about my arc of becoming a woman, just growing up. Okay. Um, but I do mention a story about being handed again all these like ledgers uh, at Geffen by the CFO. And, you know, I, what am I supposed to do with this? Well, just study it. You know, it's all these numbers and things. And I happened to notice that we were being charged five cents a unit to fold J cards, the old J card for cassettes. When right. I went to visit the plant one time, I noticed that it had been automated. And so I asked the guy, how long has this been automated? He told me about two years. So they retroactively gave all of Warner Electrosylum the rebate for, for that nice. charging nice. five cents a unit to hand operate. Obviously, you've got stories and you've got good stories to tell uh but you said your book isn't actually about those stories so tell us about the book what is it about and why did you want to write this book right now i think that you know before i knew it i felt that my you know i suddenly as i became to this to this stage in my life um it really began to occur to me that you know my childhood was kind of stolen from from me. I never really had the opportunity to have a normal childhood. I was abused from the time I was five years old, you know, which is why I ran away. It really affected me because I think that in many ways I had like a lot of developmental arrest because I was so busy trying to pretend I was grown up that I never really grew up. And I think if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it abstract. sounds like you fit right into the rock and roll industry. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, you know, Steven Tyler uh, definitely, you know, taught, told me he had developmental arrest. And, you know, that's why he could get away with pulling his pants down and at the Four Seasons Hotel and mooning me in the jacuzzi, you know. I mean, it almost killed <laughs> me on an 80-foot dive in Hawaii. So because he uh, abandoned me when he was supposed to be my buddy. And then I was saved by the famous producer, Bob Ezrin, press pistol. Yeah, I have a lot of stories like that, but that wasn't really the heart of what kept nagging at me. And I was going through, you know, some of my old journals and I came upon a journal, and this is in the preface of my book, uh, that I wrote when I was 12 years old. And it said, this is a story about me, nobody special. Like, why do you want to read this book? It's about me. Nobody's special. And I really felt like it just, I started crying. I read those words in my little handwriting at little hearts and things. And I said, you know, I really felt when I was 12, I wanted to tell this story of what happened to me. 
And I thought it was important. And so looking back all of a sudden in reflective mode and seeing the whole trajectory in front of me of what happened to me, it really underscored, I really need to tell, I really need to talk about this. And I've, you know, I called the book Blind Pony because I was literally given a blind pony by my grandfather. And he was the one abusing me. And he did it, you know, as a form of control over me. You know, I had sisters and they were all given, you know, beautiful horses. And and he gave me this like sort of, she had been a show pony. She had her eye kicked out and she, you know, was it was, she was damaged, which is how I felt all these years. And so, you know, it really stuck with me. And I kind of used that as a metaphor throughout the book you know, of hearing the, you know, the galloping, you know, just sort of being left in the dust by my sisters galloping up the hill because they all had stronger horses and my horse shied a lot and she had to be sort of caught, you know, taken care of, coddled or whatever, because she spooked at a lot of things. And it just occurred to me that, you know, I kind of had to do that for myself so that I wouldn't go off the track, you know. So I wouldn't spook at things. I had to be very brave. I had to, you know, take care of myself. I just really felt motivated to tell this story. And so since doing so, I really have developed, have gravitated to the story. And, you know, I've discovered there are a lot of blind ponies out there, as I like to say, because, you know, the story isn't unique, that, unfortunately. I mean, of course, certain things about it are are unique to me, but, you know, a lot of people have been, you know, hurt and damaged and unrightfully so, and there's no recompense for them. There's nothing they can do, but they are afraid to tell people and they're afraid to talk about it. And if I can make one person feel okay about having their childhood disrupted, but going on to be successful despite all these things, or, you know, being, you know, at a place like uh, this one woman contacted me. She, I was on a small television station broadcast in Louisville, Kentucky, and she happened to hear it. Very successful woman happened to hear the show. And she reached out to me on LinkedIn and she said that she started crying. She had to hide it from her co-workers because my story was her story in a manner of speaking and she said like you know I have never talked about it with anybody you know and it's such a responsibility for me to hear something like that I'm not a psychiatrist psychologist I mean I've gone to plenty of therapy obviously but um but you know I I don't have all I can say is what I did, what helped me was and make people make fun of it. Journaling um, certainly helped me. And then going to therapy and talking about it and being honest about it and kind of coming out, of, you know, coming out of the closet in a way and just saying, yeah, this is who I really am. You know, really helped me. I mean, at one point, some I was really trying to hide my Pittsburgh accent and someone thought I sounded British. So then I became British. And then, you know, and, and at one point I had to use someone else's ID to get a job in, you know, selling alcohol. So then I became Angie, you know, I mean, it was like, I had so many identities and so many different things I was juggling and who am I, you know, it's like at one point the boss was going, Angie, Angie yelling my name. And I didn't turn around because like, I didn't know he was talking to me. So. I would forget I was Angie. Um, And then another guy thought I sounded Australian. He goes, you have a real French aesthetic for being Australian. And then I was like, oh, he doesn't believe I'm from England. Okay, I'm Australian now. (laughs) That's further away. I'll have to know less about it. You know, Um, I was just going, you know, I mean, it sounds crazy, but it's all true. And when I really thought about these things and this, you know, 15, 16 year old girl going in and play, playing backgammon with guys in their 40s, you know, and beating, the, beating their asses. You know, it's a really funny story you read about in the book of how I learned to play backgammon. But it's also very sad. Right. I mean, it's like 
did whatever I had to do to survive, basically. And um, if a lot of men took advantage of me or whatever, at least it was my choice for them to be taking advantage. I knew they were taking advantage of me. I was really a savvy little girl, you know, but it wasn't somebody abusing, like in the way that I had no control over, if if that makes sense. And that for me, it wasn't a matter of the heart anymore. It was just a matter of, of my body. I could, I could be okay with that. It was a very difficult child growing up period. And I think that when I, Got my daughter, you know, had my daughter, my life really changed for the better. It, it, it does sound like you, you've had a, an interesting life, if nothing else. Um, but it sounds like there's a lot of good feedback from people who have read the book that it's made a difference. Incredible. I mean, I never knew what to expect. And I mean, to see, you know, I've, I've got thousands of five star reviews on Goodreads. And I, you know, I told someone recently, I, I'm I was stunned when I got one star, two stars. I mean, but five stars. And people really relate to the book. Um, I know it's a difficult book to read in some of the chapters, but I think you had to know everything about the painful side to be able to, you know, grow with the character, you know, and understand some of her motivation. And like, you know, um, I've had readers tell me they're screaming at the book, like, don't do that. Don't go there. You know, but she like, why is she doing this? Why can't she be smarter than that? I was 16 years old, you know, and I'd already been on my own by that time for two years. So I graduated high school by the seat of my pants. I tested out of classes. I took correspondence courses. I, you know, it was really meaningful to me not to be a a, a, a high school dropout. I'm glad I wrote the book. Like I said, if it helps one person out there, you know, to be there, to be your authentic self is the best version of yourself. Like to be at this place in my life and to be able to tell people and be honest about, you know, I'm, I wasn't some rich kid growing up, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, when I worked at Geffen, I mean, I'd go out and spend $3,000 on an outfit to go to a meeting, you know? I was very stylish. People thought, you know, they never thought I was someone who had such a, an arduous childhood. You know, um, I never let anyone in on that side of myself in relationships, nothing like I, I just didn't go there. I didn't want to talk about being from a farm in Pennsylvania and being abused. And, you know, it was a very dark place and, and neglected as well, parental neglect. But, you know, now I feel very free and I feel very happy and satisfied that there's no sort of skeleton in my closet, you know, that's going to jump out and at any moment, you know, blow everything for me or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like it's a very free feeling. So let me ask this uh, with your book, um, because I know it's a memoir and it's a very personal book. If you had the chance uh, to turn this into either a movie or a TV show, which would you choose like to see it as? Well, at this point, I I would have to say definitely a series because it's too epic to be a film. It really is. Um, and I have thought about this. And, you know, I spent a good part of my career in indie film, as I told you. And to me, I'm actually surprised it hasn't been snatched up yet (laughs) because it's really you know I've read I've worked on films that were um you know difficult cells or whatever this is just it's all there I mean Queen's Gambit had chess and this has backgammon I mean it's hysterical and it's you know and I think that flawed female characters are so popular right now so I'm definitely not I'm definitely leaning toward series and I'm not, I'm, I won't be surprised that it'll be picked up because it's, it's a really rich story and it's an incredible vehicle for a young actress. Um, it's who, who would you like so to much play range you? that she has to, she has to become three different people with all these different accents and it's just, and it, and it goes from, 
Pennsylvania to Phoenix, Arizona, to Los Angeles, to London, to Paris, to Hamburg. You know, I left out Stockholm, Sweden, and Japan because it was just too much cover. It's it's really an epic story, and it's I think it's a very heartfelt story. You know, like I said, there are some difficult things to read in the book, but that's easy to kind of skate around in a series. So, Samantha, who would you like to play you? Uh, which actress? Gosh, um, a lot of people have actually asked me that, and I. It depends on when the film is made because you know the the character is so young. Um, I think it's got to be someone who's an up and comer. You know, we don't even know who, yet who they are um, because you know films take a while to put into production, and so who I like today might be too old by the time the film's made. So right. it needs to be somebody who can play the range. I think it's two two different. You know, the younger Sam and then um than the older but she'd have to really go from age 14 to you know when she hits the road or you know when she goes to phoenix i went to phoenix arizona looking for my father and i found him but he was you know kind of just a bullshit artist and you know um very meaningful relationship to me but you know i he said he couldn't take me in and you know i had to get an apartment and he did help me in my hangover enroll in high school the day after I met him. And then I didn't see him for three months. So, (laughs) you know, um, but he was a character and there's some funny stories in the book about that relationship, which I think are really part of the, some of my favorite stuff. Um, But then when I, then I, I leave him and I go to uh, LA, you know, kind of just, Basically, people say, did you want to be an actress? Is that why you went to L.A.? And I'm like, no, it was just too hot in, in Phoenix. You know? <laughs> I didn't want to go back to the cold. So I came over here, you know, and, and that was the big motivation. Um, like I said, I had no practical life skill um, except what I taught myself. And you've got to think, too, you know, everywhere I went, different jobs I got, I had to use a fake ID. I had to hitchhike to get there. I was too young to get a driver's license. I mean, there were a whole, you know, there were many things I had to overcome along the way that you just don't think about when you grow up in a normal, healthy, loving home. Like I look at my kids and I, each one of them, I love them so much. It just is um, I can't even express to you how much I love my children and how great they are. And they're so intelligent, so well-adjusted humans. It's the thing that I'm most proud of, obviously, but I, I just, I look at them and I see how much I love them. And I just, I just scratch my head and say, I can't understand why I wasn't loved like that. It's like, I mean, that's really at the heart of the story. Like, Why? how could that be that, you know, I wasn't loved in the way I love my kids, you know? So I think that's why I wrote the book. I wanted to claim back some little piece of my childhood, some little part of me, some little part of my innocence, you know? So I, I did it. I think it was a very brave brave thing to do, you know, but um, I've gotten great support from people for writing it. So I'm really happy, even from my clients. So do you have plans for another book? A, a sequel yes, or a I second do. thing? Okay. Yes, I and do. What? I'm actually um, I'm actually working on two different pieces. One is a, a novel, but it's kind of based a little bit on some of my experiences again. But I'm going to fictionalize. Okay. Um, I don't want to write another memoir. It's coming along really well. I've I've got the ending, which is kind of a shocker which I'm really excited about, you know, that's the, that's the brilliance of fiction is you can take reality and then you can twist and bend it and make it anything you want, like a Gumby doll, you know, it's like, whereas with a memoir, you have to be very faithful to what happened, reveal that much about myself. Again, I'm just done with that. (laughs) So there's that book. And then the other book I'm working on is more of a coffee table book. And it's taking drawings that were made of me by the father of my daughter, who um, 
passed away and when I cleaned up his estate, uh, although I hadn't seen him in 30 years, I felt it was my responsibility because no one else was around to do it. And so I took care of closing up his estate. And um, he was a brilliant singer-songwriter discovered by Bob Dylan, produced by Robbie Robertson, had two albums on Warner Brothers. But then he kind of, you know, just didn't, success just didn't happen for him, you know, um, on a big level. You know, he was a pet poet of a lot of people, but he drew me every day as a young prepubescent girl, basically naked, up until I got pregnant, my daughter, and they never drew me again. And I thought, when I, all of a sudden I was cleaning the garage, which he's a pack rat, it was just filled with junk, and this portfolio dropped down on top of my head, almost knocked me out, and I opened it, and it was the drawings out perfectly preserved and so i want to um create a collection of his drawings because i think they're beautiful and but they're from the male gaze right and then i want to juxtapose that with the female gaze in my writing um nice. you know so um you know and i i really i really want to do so I'm, that's kind of a passion project and i'm going to um that sounds cool. Yeah, that's something that I'm going to donate the proceeds for that to um, oh, interesting charity. Well, well, but, Samantha, uh, all your work and your book it sounds really exciting, interesting. It sounds like it's helping a lot of people, which I think is really you know great, giving back uh, to the world. Uh, and I appreciate you taking some time to talk to us about it. We're going to talk about uh, some author things coming up next. Uh, so. Thank you for sharing your book with us. Okay, well, thank you again for having me. Thank you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.